this is Dr. Ralph Wilson with Jesus Walk, Beginning the Journey. And this is Lesson 9, Worship, Communing with God. We humans desperately need to worship, that is, to come before God, to honor Him and draw close to Him. Why? Because we need God. St. Augustine said it well, God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Along these same lines, Blaise Pascal observed, there is a God-shaped vacuum in every heart that can only be filled by God himself. You know, it's possible to perform acts of worship, such as prayer, Bible reading, giving offerings, singing, in an outward and formal way, just going through the motions. Indeed, that's how many worship. But merely outward worship is satisfying to neither God nor to us. Jesus quoted the prophet Isaiah in saying, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He's not talking about the emotional ups and downs that we experience from day to day but about people who don't really love God or care about Him. Sometimes when you come to worship, your heart may seem cold, your thoughts distracted. Well, I want to encourage you, enter into worship anyway. Seek to focus your mind on the Lord. The point is to bring your worship before the Lord intentionally, not just going through the motions. Often, after a little spiritual exercise, your, your mind and body will be able to enter into worship wholeheartedly. Your spirit just needed a little warm-up exercise before the Lord. Different generations and traditions may prefer one style of worship to another. Our preferences tend to be heavily influenced by our culture. But the Bible doesn't spell out one right way of worship. Heart worship has little to do with the various styles and traditions of worship. Formal liturgical services with readings, responses, and traditional hymns are no more less heart worship than non-liturgical services that feature contemporary choruses and people dressing casually. You can enter into heart worship in either style or just go through the motions. By all means, you should attend a gathering of Christians every weekend for public worship, as we discussed in Lesson 4. You need to join a church and participate in its worship and ministries to the community. But your worship shouldn't take place primarily in a church setting. That should only be the tip of the iceberg. Your primary worship should take place day by day as you live out your life before God. True heart worship should fully engage you in communion, that is, two-way communication between you and God. You'll be giving worship to God and receiving blessings from God. First, let's look at some of the ways of offering worship. You don't have to do all of these. They're just some suggestions so that your offering of worship isn't just on a single track, but can be more expressive of your heart. Praise acknowledges uh, the greatness of God. Remember the ACTS, ACTS acronym that we looked at in Lesson 2. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Praise is the adoration part of this. We don't praise God to stroke his ego or make him more inclined to answer our prayers. We praise him because he's worthy of our praises. Considering his power and majesty, his love and mercy, and all his other attributes, it's appropriate to offer praise. The book of Psalms in the Bible, which has served as a song book not only for Jews but also for Christians, gives many examples of this. Here's one, Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Praise is a way of enthroning Christ as King, of acknowledging his rightful place as our Lord and God. If you think about it, 
Praise is the language of faith. When we speak praise to God, even when we're going through difficult times, we are demonstrating our love for and trust in God. Praise can be on our lips throughout the day, not just during our custom times of worship. When you're alone, try shouting to God, Praise you, Lord! Or some other word of praise. Don't limit your praises to just the domesticated variety. Let your spirit express your love in whatever way seems appropriate at the time. Here's another. Singing. God's spirit has inspired many thousands of hymns and songs which have helped Christians lift their praise to God and honor him by telling of his greatness. The lyrics, combined with beautiful melodies, have a way of help us, helping us express ourselves to God on many levels, with our mind as well as with our emotions. When Christians sing together in a larger meeting, the presence of everyone joining together in worship and praise helps us express our corporate love for God. It's often inspiring to us. And God looks down on such heartfelt worship with pleasure. But don't limit yourself to singing only at church gatherings. Uh, begin to sing to the Lord at home, on your way to work. It doesn't really matter whether or not you can carry a tune. Just sing. You'll find it helps you offer worship to God. We talked about the importance of thanksgiving as the T in the Acts memory device. Thanking God for what he's done is just plain basic gratitude, as well as an act of worship and honor. It should be a regular part of your personal worship. We talked about confession as the C in Acts, as well as in Lesson 3 about dealing with temptation. Regularly confessing any recent sins that God brings to mind. Saying a prayer of repentance and receiving God's forgiveness is an important part of worship, too. Prayers are prayers or supplications are the S in Acts. I want to encourage you to make this part of your worship, not just as requests, but talking over with God aspects of your life and the challenges you face. Thus, prayer becomes a discussion, a dialogue, not merely a monologue on your part. I like to talk to God about my life as I take a walk. Of course, there'll be requests that you are asking God for, too. Perhaps you've thought that the offering plate at church was a kind of embarrassment. It's not. We Christians see giving towards God's work as part of our worship of him. More on that in Lesson 11. Since ancient times, believers have used the occasion of eating as a time to give thanks to God. Though you'll often hear Christians blessing the food itself, the Old Testament and New Testament practice was to bless and praise God before eating. Make your meals a time to worship God. And then the conduct of your life. There are many other elements of Christian worship, but in a very real way, the Bible tells us that the very way you live your life is your spiritual act of worship. Different churches have different traditions of postures in prayer or worship. Now, there are no rules or requirements here, but you may find some of these helpful to you personally in your own quiet time with God. A bowed head shows reverence before God. But you may also find it's helpful to look up and pray. Folded hands during prayer, <laughs> I think was more an invention of parents trying to keep children from fidgeting during prayer. But if folding hands helps you pray attentively, uh, tentatively, that's great. Eyes closed during prayer can cut down on distractions. <laughs> but then again, it may induce sleep. And don't close your eyes while praying during driving a car or riding a bicycle. Lifted or outstretched hands has a long history in the Bible as a prayer posture. Many find this meaningful, though in some congregations people will think you're a radical if you lift your hands. Palms open to God can express requesting or openness. Hands lifted heavenward can be a sign of praise or adoration. Kneeling is a customary prayer posture in many homes, 
Some churches have built-in kneelers for worshipers to use during prayer. Lying prostrate on the ground or the floor is found in some traditions and can, be, uh, can represent full surrender before God. It's seen in the service to ordained priests in the Roman Catholic tradition, for example. Making the sign of a cross is practiced in some churches. While some people may cross themselves superstitiously, others do this reverently as an act of worship. The sign of the cross is usually made by touching the hand sequentially to the forehead, the chest, and then each shoulder. You'll find other postures and acts of worship in the scriptures, including dancing, clapping, and leaping. I mention these postures and worship for two reasons. First of all, to help you explore various ways that you can express yourself to God in your own personal worship. Try some of these postures. You may find that they help. Two, to help you understand worship practices that you may have observed in others. Christians have developed various worship traditions over the years, different for people in different areas of the world and different histories. We can learn from each other. Well, we've looked at ways to offer worship to God. Now let's consider ways that we can receive during our times of communing with God. Let me emphasize, we don't worship for what we can get out of it. That's selfishness, not true worship. We worship because God is worthy. But having said that, we do receive much as we worship, since God intended us to. Instruction. Most corporate worship services have a period of instruction called variously a sermon, a message, or a homily. The point is not the eloquence of the preacher, but what God wants to say to you personally during this time. His Holy Spirit is active with the Word of God to help you grow. Listen for God's voice to you during this time. During your own quiet times of worship and meditation, you are also seeking God to teach you. That's why you read a passage from the Bible. Closely related to instruction is guidance for our own personal lives. Sometimes, when we're seeking what we should do, God will speak to us during a worship time, since it is then that our hearts are particularly focused on God. This has happened to me many times. Often, what God will speak to me has little to do with the speaker's message. But God's own message is imprinted on my heart and my mind. Besides vocal worship through singing and prayer, I encourage you to let yourself become quiet before God. Sit before him and listen. Often he'll drop a word or two into your heart that are just for you. You see, worship is a time of communion between you and God. Your life with the Lord is meant to be a conversation, a dialogue, a back and forth between you and God. The final blessing of worship is joy. Joy in the presence of the Lord. I didn't always experience joy when I was young in the Lord, probably because I hadn't learned the practice of praise. But now, again and again, I find gentle joy in the Lord during my worship. It's part of the love for God that the Holy Spirit is growing in my heart. Realistically, though, we don't always hear God or feel much comfort. Our hearts may be distracted when we come to worship. At times we may be going through depression when we experience little joy. Sometimes our worship and devotion seem dead, empty of any spiritual life, or at least that's the way we feel. But since we worship because God is worthy, not as an emotional pick-me-up, we continue to worship God no matter what our emotions are like at the time. In normal times, however, we learn to quiet our hearts before him, and the worship we offer to God will be from our hearts. The blessings that we receive from worshiping him will infuse our beings with a sense of his holy presence. The Gospels show us Jesus' own example of prayer and regular worship. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. 
For Jesus, praying each day and gathering regularly with others for worship and scripture reading on the Sabbath was a good habit that was essential to nourish his relationship with the Father while he was here on earth. It's easy to get out of the habit of worship, both in our own daily quiet times and even worship with the body of Christ on the weekend. Resist the temptation to neglect worship. Satan seeks to weaken you by starving you spiritually. He can't grab you out of God's hand, but he can pull you away from regular fellowship with God and so weaken and neutralize your joy, peace, witness, and effectiveness as a child of God. So make worship central in your life. That is the practice of Jesus, and this is the way of his disciples. Let's pray together. Father, you are worthy of all our praise. I ask you to help us to give you the honor that is due your name. Teach us to worship you. Teach us how to praise you. Teach us to listen to you and pour our hearts out to you. Make this a channel of communication between us that is strong and well used. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your memory verse for this week is Psalms 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Okay, take out your questions and discussion points and discuss the lesson with your mentor. And don't forget to go over some of your previous memory verses to keep them sharp in your mind. And may God richly bless you.